And uh, so this is all manual. If you look here, you can see, this is a good picture because you can see um, here that there's big green beans and then little ones, and he's already picked most of the, the, uh, the right ones off. That's Sabina, it's a good word. And uh, so what will happen is during the day, the guys will go out and pick this, and uh, in the afternoon, they'll bring it in, and it's measured out in these five gallon buckets. And the guys get about, and women too, uh, they get about a uh, $1.50 per five gallon bucket. And a good picker can pick uh, eight of those a day. And really, there are a couple of really fantastic people who can pick 12 of those a day. But uh, we, we live in a, a place where the, uh, the daily wage is about $8 a day. That's very similar to Brazil, and you, you need to keep that in mind when we go to little places like the Boca de Valeri, um, that you just don't go in and throw money around because you have it. But, uh, uh, so that's, that's, what, that's, for them it could be a, a good, good income. So this is what coffee looks like when it's picked, ready to go, and ready to be processed. And if you took one of these cherries, when it's ripe, and you squeezed it, out would pop these two seeds, which are? the coffee beans, right? But between that point and when you get it in your cup, there's a whole lot that happens. So when we first went there, we wanted to learn everything we could about the traditional ways of doing this. And one of the traditional ways is to, to it's called dry it in the cherry. So you just lay the cherries out and you let them out like that and they dry in the sun. The more common way is what's called the wet method. And so uh, how they would do, they would take and they would put all these uh, red cherries in in, uh, in first of all, you put banana leaves in the bucket, and then you throw the red cherries in, put some water in, cover it over with banana leaves, and you let it sit for about uh, two, three days, sometimes four, until it starts, just until it starts to ferment and the, the cherry starts to rot off. Then you stick your hand in this mess and you go like this and you, you clean all the junk off and you keep washing it a number of times until it finally comes out to, as, as just a clean coffee bean. Uh, how that's done now, mostly commercially, is big uh, beneficios like this one down the hill from us. Uh, we'll take our coffee down and we sell it to this big company. Uh, they sell all over the world. A lot of it goes to Germany, up to uh, Scandinavia, to uh, Japan. And a lot of what they get goes to Starbucks. So uh, if you uh, drink Starbucks coffee, probably every billionth bean is from my farm. So you can think about me when you sip your Starbucks. Uh, but, you know, some people will come in with a, a truckload of 60, 100 bags, other people come in with 30, 40 bags. Some people just come in with a, by taxi cab with a little half bag full and they, they'll, they'll buy it there. So what happens is it's, it's all measured out and they keep track of this. And it's measured into this thing which is called a latte. And that's the, the unit of measurement. And for this latte of coffee, uh, we're going to end up by the time the coffee gets on the shelf in the store, uh, we end up as a grower getting about 35 cents of that. And our coffee in the state sells for $16 a pound. So uh, you can see that there's, a, <laughs> there's not much money in growing coffee. The real money is, is when it's processed in the states and stuff like that. But it's kind of like uh, wine. And, and I, I, we have, I think it was the last cruise I had some people on who had vineyards in California. And, and they're, they were kind of in the hobby farm business too. And you know, you do this because you, you like it, you, you, but it's not really a big money maker. So uh, when we take it in, it goes into, and they put it in these big vats for about 24, 72 hours to, so the, uh, the outer husk, the cherry starts to rot off. Then they throw in a big machine like this, which strips off the outer husk. And then the coffee is traditionally, it was laid out in the sun to dry. Now, I said in the beginning that we wanted to do all this stuff and learn all this stuff, so uh, <laughs> my, my wife had carefully laid all this out in the driveway, and, and the one Dalmatian, maybe this is why the Dalmatians like coffee, I don't know, but it was a puppy and, and went running out and thought it was to eat, and it wasn't kibble, so then she thought it was to play with, and my wife had this moment of crisis. Uh, do I take the picture or preserve the coffee? She took the picture. But uh, typically how it's done commercially is nowadays is you have these big uh, rotating dryers, like a clothes dryer. And it would be from about here over to the screen over there, about that big. And they'll put the coffee in there and it'll be in there about uh, uh, roughly about 40 hours. 
and, and these things just are turning around. It's fire, generally most of the firing is done with, uh, with wood. We have a, if you have a coffee farm uh, up where we live in the rainforest, the stuff obviously is growing, and we grow shade-grown coffee, but you don't want too much shade, so you have to uh, tr trim your trees from time to time, and we have a lot of trees, and you live in a rainforest area, every time we get winds or high rains or stuff, there's always trees falling down over the road. So these guys will go out and they'll clean them off the road, and they'll bring the stuff back, and, and that's what they, they burn for fuel. So when the coffee then is dry, it's put in these bags, and then it has to do what is called resting. And for resting, that means the coffee just sits there in these bags like this for anywhere from three to six months, just resting before the next step. Now, the, the coffee bean at this point has a, something on it which is called the parchment. And it looks a little like, remember onion skin paper? Uh, it, or copy paper, it looks a little like that, and you've got to get that off. So the traditional way of doing that was to put it in one of these things made from a, a tree trunk, and you'd peel on it, you'd bang up and down to kind of hammer it, and then you'd take and you'd throw it up in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and you'd be left with just the bean. Uh, nowadays that's all done in, in a machine that does that in, in the beneficio. So what you're left with when all this is done is this, which is called green coffee. And it's called green coffee, why? Because it, it has this kind of straw green color. So these bags will then be, be, be sewn up. This is very, very, very good expensive coffee. This, is, uh, this particular stuff goes all over to, to Germany and it's, it's very expensive. But, but it, it doesn't look maybe like what you're used to with coffee beans because you, the first thing you'll be surprised is they're very tiny. But the reason is that once they are roasted, then that bean is going to at least double in size. Okay, so uh, it, and it's it's not it's the, the green color because it has yet to be roasted. So that's what we export, and then the roasting is really a key part. Every step along the way is a, is a key part in really getting the, the final product uh, right. So uh, roasting is is not so much a science as it is an art. Uh, it'll be roasted for about 10 to 15 minutes. The temperature inside the bean will get up to about 450 degrees. And as this is going on, you'll see a definite color progression. You go from that green coffee to various shades of brown. And, and some of you who like a, an Italiano or a very dark uh, roast, will know it's very much darker. If you like a, a light roast, a city roast, or maybe a medium Latina roast, They'll be all different shades depending on how long it's been roasted. But during this period, the, the beans will double in size, they'll pop open, they lose about 18 to 24 percent of their weight, which is, is, is the moisture being taken out. But in that process, it releases all of the flavors within the bean. So again, this is, this is, is an art, not a science. And then you, you have something which is called cupping, where, where they actually will taste this stuff. And, and when the, the buyers come to buy, uh, lots of beans. It's just like a wine, uh, wine tasting. You have a big round table, and there will be all these little little cups of coffee, and they'll come along with a, a spoon and they'll <laughs> and swirl around in their mouth and, and come up with all these flavors that I'll talk about in a minute. And they'll spit it out, and they'll go to the next one, and, and that's just how it's done. And they're looking for flavor, they're looking for acidity, they're looking for body, they're looking for aroma, all of these things. Now, in cupping. Um, much like, like the wine, you have this whole, these are all the tastes that they're looking for. So, does it taste like garlic? <laughs> Most people are not going to want to buy, pay much for coffee that tastes like garlic. When you go over here, you can see, uh, where, where is it here? There's one that says like dishwater, dishwater. Uh, medicinal or turpentiny or, or uh, someplace on here is like dishwater. And, and uh, we have had coffee, we've experimented with this thing, and we've had some batches that we started with very good beans, but it was roasted wrong and ended up you taste it and say, ooh, it tastes like dishwater, <laughs> which it does, so some coffee does. So our particular coffee, uh, what it really excels in is up in this area. So it has a definite floral taste like coffee blossoms, like orange blossoms, citrusy lemon, and uh, some blackberry berry thing, a little bit of chocolate. But it, it gets this, you have these very rich tastes, 
in the coffee. Now people always ask, well, what about the coffee on the ship? And uh, being a good guest, I don't have much to say about it. But <laughs> um, the problem on ships is this. Um, if we were only going to serve one red wine on the entire Prince's fleet, what would it be? Ripple. Ripple. <laughs> No, would it be Merlot, would it be Sauvignon? I mean, you know, there's so many choices. Would it be from California, would it be from Chile, would it be from, yeah, we, you know, you only had one choice, okay? So that's the problem with coffee. We got one kind of coffee for the entire fleet. Hopefully we'll get to the days where you have this great big list of coffee and you can pick what you want and, and that would be great. But the, the, the whole taste with coffee is evolving to that point. The important thing with coffee is it's what you like. And, and people always ask, well, do we sell our coffee? No, we don't. Uh, we sell it to this big producer. We're actually experimenting this year. This is a little machine like it was traditionally used. We've got to strip off the cherries. And we've actually kept out about 800 pounds, I think, that we're going to play with and, and see. Um, I, I used to do a lot of uh, the canal cruises. And, and people would always say, well, we're getting into either Cologne or, or uh, uh, Amador, you know, where can we get your coffee? Well, we don't sell. Well, where can we get good Panama coffee? It turns out nobody sells it there. And so a couple of the vendors there said, look, if you can give us the stuff, we'll sell it. So we're playing with that. The, the biggest problem for us is how to dry it and how to dry it in the sun, because the big harvest is coming in the middle of the rainy season, and that means we don't have a lot of sun. So if you go to my house, every place you look for the past couple months, we've had coffee everywhere. But out of all this coffee you see drying, because we sell gourmet coffee, which means every bean has to be perfect. So out of all this stuff, by the time we've hand sorted through and stuff, we maybe get to about 20-30% of the perfect beans, because when you're selling gourmet stuff, it's got to be perfect. Uh, now the four fundamentals of, of making a good cup of coffee, number one is proportion. And we're talking about drugs, so the dose is important. And the proportion should be about two tablespoons of coffee to six ounces of water. How many of you make your coffee like that? Okay, if you don't, you're probably drinking coffee which is just too thin and watery. So try doing this. The other thing is the grind. You need to use the right grind of coffee for your coffee maker. If it's too coarse, then the water rushes through too quickly and you end up with watery coffee. Makes sense, doesn't it? If it's ground too fine, then the water is going to sit there too long and you're going to end up with bitter coffee. So you've got to get the right grind and you need to use fresh cold water just off of oil. Starbucks, Tim Hortons, all those big chains have spent a lot of money when they opened the store to put in processing equipment to take all of the local uh, chemicals and chlorine and stuff out of the water so that they can start with pure water. And then you want to use a fresh brewed coffee. If it's been sitting around the office for two hours, it's junk, throw it away. Um, and you want to use fresh ground beans. Now the reason for using beans is once coffee is roasted and it's ground, it has a shelf life, even in the store, in a vacuum, whatever, 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 it has a shelf life of three months and then it will start deteriorating very rapidly. The beans, once they are, are, are roasted, have a shelf life of about a year. Now there will be a little bit of, of denigration near the end of that, but not enough for most people to, to really appreciate. So if you get beans and if you grind them, and you can spend anywhere from $22 to $150 to $200 for a grinder, um, and, and it may make a difference for if you're a real snob. For me, it doesn't. I mean, we use a $22 Black & Decker little grinder, uh, put the beans in, grind them, put them in, make the coffee, and that will vastly improve the coffee doing it just fresh like that not letting it sit around uh, people always ask well, where you know should we put the coffee beans in the freezer what do you think the answer is no why moisture when you put it in, in a cold place you take it out you put it back in you take it out it's getting condensation it's getting moisture and that's the worst thing for coffee so if you want to keep your coffee beans you, you, 
use like Tupperware or something like that in, in a sealed container, keep it in a cool, dark place, and just drink a lot of coffee. I mean, don't get a whole ton of them. Just, that should, you know, that should be fine. Okay, so when you buy coffee, like anything, you make your purchasing decisions. This is a Brazilian uh, coffee plantation. It has been clear cut from the rainforest. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, in another lecture. Uh, you see there's no shade here that drives out birds and wildlife. This is actually taken from my bedroom. This is our farm, a shade-grown habitat for birds and wildlife. Underneath that shade cover is all this beautiful coffee uh, growing. This is a Robusta coffee farm, the cheap stuff in Bahia, Brazil. You can see endless coffee trees. Uh, this is the Boquete Panama, high-altitude shade-grown Arabica coffee farm. Totally different. This is a coffee harvester in Bahia, Brazil for the, uh, the Robusta stuff. This is Boquete coffee harvester. So it's different, and you make choices and, and, and as any consumer does. Now, people always ask about the caffeinated coffee, so I stuck this in. Uh, to start with, if you drink the good stuff, Arabica, it's going to start with half the caffeine of Robusta. And, and it, just because it's decaffeinated doesn't eliminate all the caffeine. Uh, the University of Florida did this study, and they said it took 5 to 10 cups of decaffeinated coffee and the five to 10 cups of decaffeinated coffee had about the same caffeine content as one to two cups of regular coffee. So there still is caffeine in there, but, but not so. So how do you uh, decaffeinate coffee? People always ask us. There are a lot of different methods um, and, and, and many of these. The interesting thing about a lot of these methods is you need to be a chemist to use them, okay? You see a lot of interesting chemicals that they're using to decaffeinate your coffee. It's, it's not my idea of, of what I want to drink, so that leads to my, my conclusion that, 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 that I don't do. Now, uh, the, the, the most, the best way of this, if you're going to drink decaffeinated, is what's called the Swiss water method. Now, it's got to say Swiss water method. Don't just look for water processed. Water processed is not the same thing. Water processed, they're also using these harsh chemicals. But with the Swiss water method, they're actually using water under pressure to remove much of the caffeine. So if you do like the caffeinated coffee, and actually, interestingly, this originated in Switzerland way back in the 1930s. Now most of it is done up in, in Vancouver. Um, so if, if that's what you like, that's fine. Uh, someone has said a coffee house is the ideal place for people who want to be alone but need company for it. <laughs> and uh, how many of you like Starbucks? How many of you don't like Starbucks? Every time I do this, I think I better sell my Starbucks stock. <laughs> uh, whether you like it or don't like it, uh, Starbucks has really been marketing genius. They've, they've, they've really introduced people to, to a whole new taste experience with coffee. And, and uh, you, you, those of you that don't like Starbucks, what don't you like? The taste of bitter. See, Starbucks has a roast, and it's their signature roast, and they push it just a wee bit over the top. Okay, obviously, a lot of people like it, okay? Uh, 15,000 stores, a lot of people like that, okay? But some people don't. Some people think it tastes a little bit uh, uh, burnt, you know? In Seattle, where Starbucks is headquartered, the coffee snobs in Seattle call it Charbucks, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but, but Starbucks really has been a, a great success story. Now, I, I, you know I used to be a minister, and so I want to close by doing a ministerial thing here. Uh, you all have been in, in, in churches or whatever and had what's uh, called a, like a responsive reading or a litany, you know what that is? Uh, I say one thing, and then you say what's in, in the... Uh, the, the yellow, okay, we got it? You're brilliant people, that's good. Okay, when you're worried, have trouble of one sort or another? When she did not keep her appointment for one reason or another? When your shoes are torn and dilapidated? When your income is 400 and you spend 500? You are a chair warmer in some office while your ambition led you to seek prof professional honors. You could not find a mate to suit you. You feel like committing suicide. You hate and despise human beings. 
And at the same time, you cannot be happy without them. You compose a poem which you cannot inflict upon friends you meet in the street. When you want to be seen or want to hide out, when you acquire a new flame and intend on provoking the old one, you take the new one to the old ones. That was written in 1922 and is still amazingly uh, appropriate to this day. So folks, that is the sad story of how I went from being a minister to a drug grower. 